everybody is logging in. Welcome to our presentation and thank you for joining us this morning. So please give me one minute and then we'll begin shortly. It's great to see so many familiar faces in our participant list. We have all our speakers with us, and as people log in, we will try to update them based on the, the, the presentation. But let's get started, because there's a lot we want to cover, and we're hoping to have time for uh, a fulsome conversation towards the end of our presentation. Uh, my name is David Leck. I'm a professor at Mount Royal University in Calgary, Canada. Um, and it's my absolute pleasure to be your moderator today for our presentation on behalf of what's called IFAPA. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, it's the International Federation of Adapted Physical Activity. And we have a collection here today of seven speakers who are all connected in some respect to IFAPA and adapted physical activity. And we're going to be speaking to examples of uh, inclusive and adapted physical education on a global scale. And then at the end of the presentation, uh, I'm hoping that we have a chance for conversation. So as we're going through the presentation, if you're willing, uh, by all means, feel free to pose any questions in the chat function or just hold on to them. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll moderate that conversation after our seven speakers. Next slide, please, Kwok. And so our uh, the person who is changing the slides will be one of our speakers today. And so thank you to Kwok for, for doing that for me. As I mentioned earlier, I will be your moderator and I'm the president of a FAPA and a professor in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Next slide, please, Kwok. So as I, as I suggested, we're going to speak to inclusive and adapted physical education and providing what we think are some global best practices in both research and practice. So we're going to try and bridge that divide for you again with our, our collection of speakers. We do have a variety of perspectives, including from Spain, Ireland, Latvia, uh, myself from Canada, United States, Kenya, Qatar, and from Finland. And so again, we will be uh, providing brief descriptions of specific research and or practical programs. So again, a variety of perspectives on inclusive and adapted physical education. And then we'll have a chance for questions at the end. Next slide, please. Here are our uh, seven speakers that will be going in order. And so the first one will be Catherine Carty, who's based in Ireland. She's the UNESCO chair, uh, project manager. And I'll introduce each as we come to them, but I just wanted to give you a quick overview at the front end to look at the diversity and the perspectives that we'll be sharing with you today. Next slide, please. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to start our presentation and she'll be giving us an overview and present and, and kind of reflection on inclusive physical education. And it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce my friend, Catherine Carty, the UNESCO Chair and Project Manager from Munster Techno Technological University in Ireland. Catherine, over to you. Next slide, please. Thank you, David, and thank you um, sincerely for the opportunity to present today as part of this group and, and on this topic, which is uh, really of interest. So I think uh, I'm working with the UNESCO chair in Munster Technological University in Ireland, and we support UNESCO in implementing their policy objectives around inclusion and indeed around sport. Uh, physical education and physical activity. So working very much on from the capacity building level, but also in policy advancement uh, with UNESCO around the implementation of the Kazan Action Plan predominantly, 
but we also work with with other UN agencies um, around advancing disability inclusion and indeed intersectional inclusion and advancing human rights as it connects with sport, physical activity, physical education. We can go on to the next slide, Kwok, when you're ready. Um, and I think that's about as much as I was going to say about that. So looking at promoting the right to education and um, connected with which our sport and physical education are very much connected with, with that right. So we'll have a look at some of the policy drivers around that first today and then some practical initiatives that you might be interested in to connect with human rights in your own programmes and, and in your own work. We can go on to the next slide. Okay, so this is, you know, this is what the policy landscape looks like, I suppose, at, at an international level, and there's a few European frameworks in there, but everything basically at the moment has a very, very strong emphasis on inclusion. So the kind of core policy agendas that are out there right now, this is from the Sustainable Development Goals. I mentioned the Kazan Action Plan that came from the World Conference of Sports Ministers and for which we're driving the inclusive policy actions, uh, the solutions on this inclusive policy actions. Then we have the Global Action Plan on Physical Activity from WHO, Human Rights Agenda covering multiple different human rights treaties, which I'll come to in a minute, back to the Olympic Charter, and then looking at how this intersects with Charter for Education for Democratic Citizenship and Human Rights Education, um, obviously connected with the theme of the presentation today. Um, looking at competencies for democratic culture is very much in the, how we can advance um, human rights education through the education system and linked with the European Partial Agreement on sport. Obviously, there are mul multiple other policy, uh, policy agendas that this agenda connects with that are relevant, but there's a huge amount of work driving these policy agendas at the moment that is of interest to the topic of today's presentation. So we can go on to the next slide, Kwok. So I would say, so we're talking about right to education and human rights, and human rights have been around for a long time, since 1948 in terms of the, the, the UN Human Rights Instruments, and since 2006 in terms of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. But this emergence of the Sustainable Development Goals who are that are underpinned with human rights has given a really strong new momentum to trying to advance uh, human rights um, in and through sport, physical activity and physical education. So this has created a real impetus and um, bevy of activity and action that hopefully will support driving more inclusive action in sport and physical education and physical activity. Next slide, Kwok. OK, so I wanted to focus in on just a few of the SDGs for today um, and how they connect with human rights and how they can help us in supporting and advocating for more practice in inclusive physical education for those with disabilities. So SDG 4 is about quality education and the four conventions that are most connected here are the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Conference of State Parties today, um, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So you can see the articles of those treaties very much linked to the right to education, and the right to physical education, and indeed the right to sport, is connected with each one of those articles. So. I mentioned that the SDGs have given a new impetus to these um, articles. At the moment around the world, there's a huge amount of work being done on developing indicators for countries to show what they are doing to deliver on the SDGs. What we have done in the UNESCO chair is mapped those indicators to human rights indicators. In some instances, we don't have sufficient data to report on these, but in others, maybe they'll create an opportunity for new data to emerge. And central statistics offices and other, such as the one in Ireland, are collecting the information on uh, SDGs and what's been done. Next slide, please, Kwok. Okay, SDG, so ensure inclusive quality education for all, that's SDG four, we can go on to the next slide. And the, here are some of the targets, just to show you. So there's the SDG, but then there's the target of that SDG. So in terms of inclusive education, what are we focusing on trying to gather? And what I've highlighted in yellow on the right is, are the kind of indicator data that we want to gather to understand how many people with disabilities are getting access to quality physical education and to inclusive education. You can see the targets. So each one of those targets, if you disaggregate by disability, we need to be able to see how people with disabilities 
disabilities can access these specific targets of the SDGs. We can go on to the next slide, Kwok. Quality physical education is obviously UNESCO's policy instrument around um, inclusive education. Very much the equality is, is part of this. Um, we have a program called IPEPAS to support the implementation of quality physical education. And you can see the link there to IPEPAS. My colleague Ashling is currently delivering this in Mauritius. Um, so that support is there for any university who wants to take this up to ensure that you have inclusive practice in physical education, physical activity and sport. Next slide, Kwok. And again here, SDG 10, reduced inequalities. We want to make sure that um, we promote social, economic and political inclusion so that people with disabilities can be part of the decision making processes there. And also that people with disabilities have the opportunity to get involved in, um, in employment in sport, physical education and physical activity and to access educational programs in this domain. That's also another important part of reducing inequalities. Next slide, Kwok. And we can skip this one. Thank you. Um, in terms of building capacity around the human rights based approach, so the focus of today's presentation is on human rights, but there's still a gap between knowledge um, at a grassroots level on what human rights is and how it connects to sport. We've been working with a the Council of Europe to develop a program. Uh, we have a refugee team from the Netherlands, Portuguese Olympic Committee and the GAA in Ireland, developing a blended learning program to increase understanding of human rights and sport. This will be freely available. We're currently ready for pilots. So any organization that would like to, to look at our resources, the online learning program, or to pilot the resources um, for human rights and sport, it's about sport as it should be, should be fair, should be fun, should be equitable, inclusive, et cetera. Um, that resource is ready to go. And we, I invite you all to, to uh, pilot that if you wish, or to look through the resources, it would be freely available to universities, training providers around the world in, in later in this year. And the second one we have is Trust Ireland, where we're socializing the idea of sport and human rights at a national level. So among three stakeholder groups, rights holders, looking at how they find access to sport. So in the case of disability, how do people with disability find trying to access um, sport in Ireland? Then looking at how governing bodies of sport, local sports partnerships, and indeed the education sector provide for human rights and sport. And thirdly, looking at government stakeholders and how they are, are um, resourcing um, sport and human rights at a national level. The template for Trust Ireland will be shared with other countries. And again, other countries can follow the mechanism and use the resources that we're developing for use in Ireland to socialize sport and human rights in their countries or regions. So uh, next slide, please, Kwok. And that's it. Um, so a key underpinning part of the SDGs is leaving no one behind. And it has genuinely stimulated a huge amount of activity that we really hope will shift the dial on in inclusion of people with disabilities in physical education, physical activity and sport. And keep an eye out for the array of resources or get in touch that are being developed that can help you at a national level or at an organizational level or university level to embed this agenda into your teaching and, and programming. So thank you, thank you, uh, David, again, for the opportunity to present. Thank you, Kwok, and I leave it there. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, Kwok, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So just before I um, introduce our next speaker, just as a, a quick reminder, so I did put in the chat function, if you feel comfortable, please feel free to introduce yourself and where you're from. And in addition to that, if you want to be contacted by us following this presentation, including uh, sending you the link from this presentation, please include your email address. And certainly don't, don't feel the, obliged to do that to everyone. If you want to just send your email address to me directly and or Quack directly, you're certainly uh, uh, able to do that as well. So our next speaker, so Catherine provided kind of an overview of you know, looking at inclusive physical education from an SDG perspective, in addition to some of the other you know, charters um, and, and organizations that, that she mentioned right at the outset of her presentation. And Quack is now going to focus on an initiative that took place in a European context. And we're gonna stay in Europe um, for the next couple of presentations. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce a friend of mine, Quack Ng, who's at the University of Eastern Finland and also uh, with the University of Limerick in Ireland as a postdoctoral student. So Quack, over to you. 
Hi there. Um, so thank you, David, for the invitation. Um, thanks for the introduction, Catherine, as well. Uh, it's a really nice um, um, uh, honor to be uh, speaking here on this platform. Um, so this presentation, as mentioned by David, is, is based on a project we did in Europe about this time, started about this time last year. And I've titled it Accelerating 21st Century Skills for Adaptive Physical Educators Due to COVID-19. Um, I'd like to also thank the European Federation for their assistance in that. So if we look at the document based on the right to education and the challenges with inclusive education and accessibility during the corona disease pandemic, uh, there are quite a few key messages that we can get from this in relation to uh, physical education. Uh, one, some of them are quite general, but it also applies to physical education in the sense that there are a lack of teachers, there's a lack of support, there's a lack of interaction with other children and access to internet has created a digital divide with regards to uh, education. And this is also the same for physical education. What has also been mentioned in this document is a lack of normative frameworks to make ICT uh, accessible for all, especially during lockdown as we experienced last year. And in some places, teaching went online. Some of it was radio-based or even television-based. And these lack of frameworks has, met, has meant, meant for us in Europe to think about the standards we have for adaptive physical education and for it to be updated. And so this is what the majority of this presentation is going to be uh, um, presented as. We use the framework of the TPAC model, which is based on the knowledge required for technological technology integration for education practices. It highlights the complex interplay between and among knowledge about the content, about the pedagogy and the technology to effective uh, practices. And you can see on the right-hand side, there are three circles all overlapping each other in a Venn diagram that gives seven levels of different types of interaction with regards to what is called TPAC, the Technological Pedagogical Content Knowledge. We transferred this information to physical education and we asked teachers around Europe uh, their, their opinions. We had about 125 teachers, uh, almost half of them, over half of them being female, majority of them over the age of 40. And uh, there was about a third split between novice teachers, so those teachers with less than seven years experience, intermediate teachers with teachers who may have been teaching for more than seven years, but did not have much training in adaptive physical education or expert teachers who had both training and had over seven years of experience. You can see the breakdown of the countries that were involved in this study. Majority were from Lithuania, Latvia, and Portugal. But we did also get other responses from Ireland, France, UK, Ukraine, and Romania. And there was about 60% of teachers in the general schools and about 40% that were in the special classes or special education. Now in Europe, there are many different types of special education systems. So that's why we have this uh, divide in this way that not everything is fully inclusive yet. If you want to find out more about the results, you can read this paper. It is open access and it's freely available from the European Journal of Special Educational Needs. But in summary, um, I'd just like to point out some of the key findings that we had. One is the, T the differences in the TPAC knowledge areas. That's TPAC, the technological knowledge, the pedagogical content knowledge and the content knowledge with regards to the amount of experience that teachers had. In other words, what this means is that, as we expect, the novice teachers would have lower content knowledge because that means that their knowledge to be able to deliver and to teach physical education. What is also interesting is the technological content knowledge was also quite different between the expert teachers and the intermediate teachers who had the same levels of difficulties as the novelty, uh, novice um, uh, teachers as well. What we did with this result was we updated the European standards in adaptive physical education. It is a, 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 a set of standards that we use to help with training teachers and for teachers to keep updated. And as you can see in this highlighted area, we, we use the evidence to provide uh, updated standards. And the highlighted area here is this key function that we added is identify assessment methods suitable for remote administration, which meant that the technological indicator was that we should have 
um, more functional assessments made available at distance that are both valid and reliable. That we didn't have to just uh, go to the gym to make the same assessments that we normally would have, but we could also do it safely and, uh, and well at a distance. This means that what we need to have it, to set this is a database of resources where people can use this as well as see how it works in their own language, as well as with different cultural aspects. And then we looked at the color coding, which is for implementation. And we rated it from one to four. And as you can see with number three, this was rated number three, which meant that the implementation of this uh, recommendation in the standard is that it is constrained by resources that are required by coordinator or technological skills. And on the right hand side, we see the evidence that helped us um, uh, provide this new um, standard. I would invite you all to have a look at these standards. You, it is freely available from the Open Science Framework uh, in this link of osf.io forward slash hb4xr. Um, I would invite you to, to share this with your, your teachers and with the special education area. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Kwok. So now we're going to stay within a European context and we're going to, we're going to go from Finland where Kwok is based right now. And we're going to head on uh, down south, southwest uh, to Spain. And Dr. Raul Reina, who's a professor at Miguel Hernandez University of Elche in Spain. And just as a note, I did get this uh, question from a couple of people. We will be sharing a slide deck with those who provide their email addresses so you can stop uh, furiously scribbling down notes. We'll be sharing the slide deck with you. Dr. Reina, it's over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, David, for this introduction. In this presentation, we are going to talk about the importance of teachers training for an effective inclusion in physical education. Next, please. In Spain, the pandemic was declared in mid-March last year, and in September, schools reopened with special distance measures and the application of hybrid teaching methods. Next, please. Because the confinement, Spanish public television made available a series of television programs to help students to carry out distance learning activities. In addition, the Ministry of Education publishes a series of specific recommendations on equity for teaching students with special education needs. However, all these sudden and rapid changes provoked professors felt unprepared and they had to adapt quickly to distant learning methods using information and communication technologies. Next, please. Walk. With the reopening of the schools, the Professional Board of Physical Education Teachers in Spain publishes a series of recommendations for a safe and responsible physical education, highlighting the consideration of the needs or the particular needs of students experiencing disabilities. Next, please. However, it is important to emphasize here the importance of teachers' previous experience with students with disabilities and the robustness of their previous training for an effective inclusion in physical education. Next. That previous training is represented in this, uh, in this schema, in this model, as well as uh, because the, the previous contact and experience of teaching students with disabilities or special education needs is a key factor to deliver physical education and the, strate the strategies used in practice. That is, uh, those professors uh, that um, uh, could uh, uh, have adequate or adapted uh, behavior for attending uh, student uh, needs or, uh, or could be inadequate if the professor doesn't have a, a good adequate training or successful experiences of inclusion. In addition, the specific training and the previous contact with people with disabilities will influence the attitudes toward inclusion, which may be positive and proactive or on the contrary, negative or, or the, uh, avoidance. Also, that the uh, specific training and contact uh, will influence teachers' perception of competence, which may be high or low, and in turn, influencing teachers' self-efficacy to carry out the inclusive process. Next, please. 
As an example of good practice in Spain, the Included program has demonstrated uh, its effectiveness in improving the perceived uh, competence of in-service physical educators to include the student with, phys with physical, visual and intellectual disabilities. For this purpose, different training strategies have been used like information, simulation, practical activities, discussion with people with disabilities, but also contact with para-athletes. Next. This training program carried out during three years in a peninsular region in Spain, in Spain close to my university in Elche, has also shown it effective in an insular region, Canary Island, and its materials have been also used to improve self-efficacy of preserved physical educators in other countries such as Saudi Arabia. Next. During the pandemic, the Included Guide has been useful for providing practical and informative resources such as infographics about different Paralympic sports, and they have been used for distant learning in collaboration with the Spanish Paralympic Committee or other organizations related to sport for people with disabilities. Next. As my colleague Kwok previously said about the importance of technological knowledge for development of an adequate competence in adaptive physical activity, we have adapted distant learning methods with university students belonging to a compulsory course in adaptive physical activity, achieving similar gains in the perception of self-efficacy compared to a previous academic year where the same course was delivered face-to-face, -face, previous to the, pandem the, the pandemic. Such activities included the adaptation of the theoretical and practical lessons, document analysis, indirect contact with people with, people with disabilities, case studies, among other strategies that you can see in this open access publication. Next. As stated in the United Nations document for this site event, it is necessary to have adequate technological resources to carry out distant learning effectively. For example, the use of USB smartboard or specific smartphone applications that simulate visual impairments will be very useful, improving in turn the professional skills of pre-service physical educators, but also the skills of in-service physical educators. Next. In addition, we would like to talk about other, other examples for good practice using new technologies to bring physical activities to, uh, for people with disabilities during the lockdown. The first example is found in a healthy home-based program, which during the confinement offer physical exercise sessions for a university community and the general population. For some of those weeks, uh, we asked our technical staff to design specific lessons for wheelchair users or people with mobility limitation, which was also useful for people who spend most of the time working in a sitting, in a sitting position. Next. Another example is found in a specific group of people with these intellectual disabilities who carry out a specific training program in a university setting. During the confinement, the negative impact of physical inactivity or sedentary behaviors in people with disabilities was demonstrated demonstrated due, due to the lack of support or resources at home. Because of this, remote physical exercise lessons had been conducted in ensuring that everybody was able to follow the activities at home and they had had the necessary technology resources, mainly a tablet or a smartphone and an adequate internet connection. With the reopening of the university after the confinement, the individuals with intellectual disabilities had been involved in recording a series of exercises that had been video edited and offered to other similar groups, being available for home-based home programs with the support of families or the community. And last one. In short, the idea is to use technology in a beneficial way to bring closer the reality and needs of people with and without disabilities but always encouraging uh, interactive and inclusive activities since uh, an adequate training and experiences and contact, of course, with people with uh, experiencing disabilities is a millstone for a successful inclusion in physical education and sports. Thank you so much for the invitation and open for discussion later. Thank you, Dr. Reina. 
So we started with uh, Catherine Carty from Ireland talking about inclusive physical education from a very global perspective and connecting them to the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Kwok then addressed inclusive physical education and standards from a European perspective. Raul then focused on some specific examples taking place in a Spanish context. Now what we're going to do is we're going to head back up to the Baltic Sea and uh, Dr. Aya Klavina in Latvia and also uh, aligned with the Lithuanian Sport University. And she's going to speak to examples that are taking place in her nations. Aya, over to you. Hello, hello, dear colleagues, dear friends. I see a lot of familiar names on the participant list. Uh, Sunny greetings from Riga. It's an unusual, really summer day in, in my country where I located now. However, as you can see on my slide, partially also I live in Lithuania. Since last year, I'm affiliated with Lithuanian Sport University, and I'm also still president of European Federation of Adapted Physical Activity till next year. And uh, besides that, I'm a physiotherapist and uh, also leading Sport Federation for Children and Youth with Disability in Latvia. Actually, in a picture, in the middle picture, where you see uh, two young athletes, this picture was taken in 2008 in Bruno, where there were uh, European sport games for uh, adolescents and, and young people with disability. And both of those uh, young athletes today, as they are professionals working in physiotherapy, is this lady, young lady, she's a physiotherapist. And uh, on the right side is this young man. Nowadays, he's a coach. And actually, he's also coaching uh, children with disability. So I have been um, experiencing during my professional life many uh, excellent examples how children and young people through sport became excellent professionals in different fields of, uh, of, of specializations related to sports, healthcare, and, and social welfare. Uh, next slide, please. Quack, please, next slide. So yeah, actually uh, talking about pandemic situation and inclusion, um, we were kind of, when we did study what Quack talked about, that was only time when we had lockdown for special schools in Latvia. And uh, so during 2020-2021, uh, all preschools, special education institutions, uh, kindergartens remain open. So actually, uh, special education students were lucky during 2020-2021 to be in schools whole year. Uh, however, of course, there were some um, periods of times when there was, a, uh, there was a kind of a block schedule and, and students attended school for a week and then another group of students attended school for a week. But actually, yeah, in general, uh, special education settings remained open through all uh, time period of this uh, school year while uh, nothing like that happened with general education schools and uh, uh, and uh, according to uh, obtained data by Ministry of Education and Science in Latvia, about 12% of general education students, uh, only 12% of general education students, including those who are in a special ed classes in general education settings, did not have problems with computers or internet connections. So actually more than 80% of uh, students in schools had uh, problems related to technology access or internet access. And according to Latvian Trade Union of Education and Science employees, uh, they conducted two surveys for teachers in preschools, general vocational and higher education institutions on the quality of professional life during the state of emergency. So the, the most important factors influencing professional work uh, were technical equip equipment of the study process on digital, digital skills, which are also mentioned by Quark uh, according to over survey outcomes, organization of the work of the study process, ensuring cooperation between students and colleagues. So, and um, similar issues which were related to um, also protection against the risk to develop COVID. And for example, in special ed schools where uh, teachers were uh, meeting students on daily basis, they had a weekly uh, COVID test provided for free. So that was um, not uh, provided in a whole country, but in some schools for part of the year and in some schools for whole year. 
Uh, next slide, Clark, please. Uh, so according uh, uh, current situation in, in, in uh, Latvia, uh, so we have actually long and successful tradition of extracurricular education for school age children called uh, interest education. It provided in broad different areas such as arts, music, sports, technologies, etc. And uh, more than 70% uh, of all school age children between even preschool age up to college age, uh, might be even until 25 years of age, uh, those adolescents and young uh, people can participate in uh, different out of school activities for free. And all those programs also accredited by Ministry of Education and Science and delivered by certified education professionals. For example, regarding sports, um, there are about 82 municipal authorities financed by um, uh, municipalities and they are providing about 40 uh, different sport programs involving, as you can see, more than 40,000 children and youth. However, none of these programs are provided in adapted sports. So where do children with disability have access to out of school sport opportunities in Latvia? So I will try to answer this question in my next slide. Yep, uh, so in general, uh, in special education system, uh, we of course provide uh, physical education and in uh, some schools also there are special Olympic uh, programs for children with intellectual disability. As you can see, the number of schools um, in special education have decreased only about for 10% uh, since 20 years ago. While if we look at the numbers of general education schools and uh, some schools, for example, uh, elementary school age, uh, for elementary school age children, there have been uh, 40, 42% uh, schools closed since 1990s. And uh, also middle schools, more than 50% of schools have been uh, re reorganized. So actually looking at the numbers, uh, special education system has been quite stable. I don't know, is it something to do with the uh, limitations regarding inclusive education? And as you can see also on the picture on the right side, uh, there are indications that Latvia one of, is one of those uh, European countries having uh, um, the most, uh, one of most um, uh, special education settings uh, where, where students with special education needs uh, are educated in segregated uh, education uh, institutions. And uh, so provision regarding physical education, for example, adapted physical education are not explicitly mentioned in law in our country and also the same in Lithuania. However, um, requirements for pedagogical staff working at special education settings is higher education and study that diploma in specific subject, for example, in special education. And for more than 20 years already in my country and also in Lithuania, uh, we are uh, providing pre-service adapted physical activity and adapted physical education uh, study programs for health professionals, for sport professionals, also uh, for, for education professionals. But uh, how to our knowledge, uh, there are, they haven't been data collected, for example, about healthy lifestyle behaviors for children and school age adolescents uh, according health behavioral school um, questionnaire. Like I know that my colleagues in Finland and also in uh, Israel have uh, collected data on, on healthy behavior and healthy lifestyle behaviors for uh, school age children. So we have a lot of uh, um, things to do in order to promote and to improve situation regarding uh, obtaining data on the current uh, lifestyle behaviors of children with uh, special education needs. Next slide, please. Um, so, um, yeah, the most, in, the most sports targeting people with disabilities are organized by non-governmental organizations related to social care, community sport activities like my federation in, adapt, in, in the sport for children with disability. And for example, in our federation, we are providing year-round adapted sport activities in boccia, swimming, uh, different recreation sport activities. You can see on the left side some pictures from our sport events. However, of course, those are sport events which are organized once per 
half a year or once per month, which doesn't provide children with disability to participate in regular daily physical activities. And uh, at the same time, if you look at the data from the European Commission Special Barometer on Sport and Physical Activity, so we can see that the disability or illness is the third most mentioned barrier for not taking part in regular physical activities behind lack of time or lack of motivation. So countries with a highest percentage uh, citing disability or illness as a barrier are Estonia, Finland, by surprise for me, Sweden, and also Latvia. Uh, so next slide, please. And uh, uh, yeah, finally, overall, our governments need to make political decisions soon to ensure that children and adolescents with disability have equal access to play and sporting activities in both formal and informal education settings as their peers without disability. So while students with disabilities are included in general setting, education settings with growing frequency in Latvia and across Europe, there is lack of guidelines related to professional uh, functions, knowledge and skills for adapted physical education uh, professionals who work in, uh, with, with uh, students with special education needs. So therefore, there is a need for development of state-funded support system for adapted sports the expertise of different professionals from education, sport, fitness, and the health sector should be um, benefiting uh, future programs for, for uh, people with different health issues and, and, and particularly uh, children with disability. Uh, stimulating intersectoral collab collaboration on regional, local, and international level. Also mainstream uh, sport organization partnerships importance of different government levels working effectively, particularly by allowing scope of local partnerships, because for example, in my country, uh, sport is under Ministry of Health and uh, under Ministry of Education and, uh, and Science, while if we talk about the excessive um, equipment, so we deal with social and welfare ministry, and there is some issues which are not really on the same page between both political um, institutions. And the role of advocates uh, should be um, taken part and benefited from the activities of those with experience in organizing sport activities for persons with disability. So thank you so much. And I will be open for answering questions after all presentations. Thank you very much, Dr. Kovina. And as a reminder, as to Aya's point, yes, if you do have questions, by all means, please feel free to put them into the chat uh, function and I will be moderating them and I, I will continually scan it to pull out some questions for the end of our presentation. Second, if you do wish to receive a copy of our PowerPoint slide deck and the recorded uh, presentation, please include your email address in the chat function. You can send that directly to me or Quok, or you can just leave it out uh, publicly if you wish to introduce yourselves to the other colleagues that are on um, online today. So our next speaker, so we're going to leave Europe. So we started in Ireland, um, we, we made our way up to Finland, down to Spain, up to Latvia, and now we're going to cross the Atlantic uh, to Dr. Megan McDonald, who's at Oregon State University and a Canadian uh, teaching at an American university. So we're going to get a, a great North American perspective. Dr. McDonald, over to you. Well, thank you so much. Um, for inviting me this morning and uh, to be part of this panel. So um, as David mentioned, good morning. I am in uh, from the state of Oregon where it is just about to be quarter after 6 a.m. in the morning. So I feel those of you that are up um, particularly early this morning. So today I'm going to provide a brief overview of inclusive physical education in the US. Next slide, please. So while this map represents the US, it also highlights childhood obesity prevalence across the country with darker shades representing higher percentages. The prevalence of childhood obesity in the US is about 18 point, it's specifically 18.9%. So almost 20% or one fifth of children living in the US are overweight or obese. Not surprisingly, this isn't an equal distribution. This means that there are higher rates of obesity in children with disabilities, um, estimated of, of upwards of 38% higher for children with disabilities. So as you know, physical activity is a known barrier to combat obesity and to ensure um, combating the negative health consequences associated with obesity. 
We also know in the US that physical activity is four times less likely for children with disability. And thus for all children, physical education is important. Next slide, please. So in the United States, the overarching um, federal act guiding education is the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, and this is, this is the overarching public law. And while other related public laws preceded um, ESSA, the designation of physical education as a part of a well-rounded education was welcomed by our profession in 2015. The key message here is that this act focuses on all students, including students with disabilities. Next slide, please. The overarching law guiding special education services in the US is the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, or IDEA. Um, it indicated that physical education is a direct service to children with disabilities. And this law ensures special education services for children with um, disabilities between the ages of birth and 21 years old. So this actually includes transition services for um, students with disabilities. And what I mean by that are transition services as students graduate high school and enter into the community. So it guarantees public assistance and access to physical education um, from K through 12, so kindergarten until grade 12, um, and as students exit uh, beyond that, so until 21 years old. As students transition out of physical education, this might take place in a more traditional gymnasium or physical education education classroom as we know it, excuse me, or what's also been recommended by one of our guiding organizations, Shape America, is that um, these the transition services for physical education take place in community-based settings. So this might look like fitness facilities or recreational programs in the community where the student lives. Next slide, please. What's also designated an idea is that students are educated in their least restrictive environment um, so this is really important um, because what this means is that for, um, students are, we want them to be included and with other students and that this is actually mandated. So in the next slide, please, we'll see a schematic representing this. So this schematic identifies exemplars of the least restrictive environment that IDEA mandates for students. Um, and um, so inclusion, of course, is a, is a community and a belief among all stakeholders and ultimately to create an equitable environment for all students. So what we see here is that the general education and physical education classroom is ideal. Um, and we only move towards a more least restrictive environment if that's something that's required by the students. Next slide, please. And the final slide, um, while there continues to be work to do, the focus of PE for children with disabilities is on equity. These services work when the supports necessary for the student are present, leaning into the philosophy of inclusion. So in March, 2020, there was a disruption to the continuity of services. Um, physical education and adapted physical education teachers pivoted like the rest of the world. And physical education was mostly delivered remotely for the remainder of that particular school year. In the fall of 2020, when students were scheduled to go back to school, responses varied substantially by state. This included in-person resumption for some schools, hybrid schooling and remote schooling, including both synchronous and asynchronous options for students. The great news in the US right now is that we're making substantial progress on vaccinating the country. There's hope as we exit the pandemic that we'll take the best of what we knew before our collective responses to COVID-19 and the best of what we learned during the pandemic. From a national perspective, um, we've had guidance for physical education from Shape America, um, in including standards for physical educators um, and ideas about how to teach remotely. And also for adaptive physical educators, we've had guidance from the National Consortium for Physical Education for Individuals with Disabilities focused on the adaptive physical education standards. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McDonald. Um, so we're now going to leave North America and we're going to head across the Atlantic again uh, to Kenya, where Dr. Peter Bukala, who's an associate professor at uh, Masinde Malu, <laughs> oh, and I practice this, Peter, Masinde Maluro University of Science and Technology in Kenya will be speaking with us, and he'll be reflecting on a camp experience as opposed to uh, a more formal physical education experience that we've talked about in our most uh, three most recent 
uh, presentations. Peter, can you hear me? Are you there? Thank you so much, David. And thank you for inviting me to present. I can see you are picture, not mine. Why? <laughs> I can already see your picture, not mine. So, so let me just go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So we're on. We're on your first slide. Sustainable, inclusive sports. Would you like us to switch slides? I just wanted to say that uh, I'm going to present my work as a professor at the university and also somebody who is engaged on a daily basis in working with children with disabilities outside of school setup, but over weekend programs. Next, next slide. Uh, it's, as everybody has spoken, it is true that sport is a powerful mean for inclusion, inclusion and socialization. Uh, sport for people with disabilities provides an excellent opportunity to activate the UN Convention. So the things that Catherine had talked about, sport provides that opportunity. And the UN CFPD indicates this very clearly. Next. Uh, statistics. Statistics from uh, the world show that about 1 billion people in the world live with some form of disability. And nearly 200 million of them experience considerable difficulties in functioning. Uh, one statistic that I wanted to mention out of saying this is that 80% of those with disability live in developing nations. Next. Next, next slide. And, and that even those 80%, only 2% of them in developing nations receive any form of special service. So we see that you have many people with disabilities, they do not access opportunities specifically for sports. So despite many nations having signed the UNCRPD, those with disabilities rarely benefit. And this is a, a critical issue in developing nations. Why are the developing nations signing for uh, this UNCRPD and they're not providing anything? The support facilities they need to access are seldom available. And UNESCO has mentioned this. Next. Next slide. Uh, so in addition, the experience of many of them is that uh, there are barriers to access services. These include health services, education, employment, uh, transport, and information to where they can access the, the services required for them to participate in inclusive uh, activities. Next. Now, what I did is in 2009, I decided that uh, I would think outside of the box and develop a sport program, an inclusive program at the university. So as much as I was teaching uh, physical education, adapted physical education to my students, I thought they needed to participate in a program that will give them a chance to learn how to include learners with disabilities. So in 2009, we developed the Camp Shriver at my university then, Kenyatta University. Uh, next. So the program was developed uh, specifically to engage with disabilities in sports that they were rarely uh, participate in, in the community. And one of them was basketball which is sometimes thought as a high elitist uh, sport, but I wanted my, my children with disabilities to engage in it. A second one was I wanted them to learn how to swim, something that they will not get in the community. A third one is just to run and play like every other child and play football. So we started off by developing a team of volunteer coaches from amongst my students. So about 40 of my students were signed up to participate in this particular program. And we now went around the community, about a kilometer around the kilometer, one kilometer radius of the university. 
and brought in young children with disabilities, specifically those with intellectual disabilities, and encouraged them and those within their community without disability to come with them to the field. So every child without a disability who participated in had to make sure that he brought or she brought a neighbor with a disability so that they became now like buddies coming into the university every Saturday. Next. Next. So every Saturday, we had all these children coming into the university paired one with and those and the other one without. So they would be trained by my students uh, whom I had trained as volunteers. I trained them on how to deal with children with disabilities and brought them all together on Saturdays to learn different skills. We are lucky that uh, at the beginning we got sponsorship and this sponsorship enabled us to start the program. Uh, we led, these activities were led by university students uh, in various sports, but the most interesting part was that at the beginning, many of the parents did not want to bring their children. So what we did was we brought so that they can bring their children on Saturday because of fear, because of stigma. Next slide. Uh, when we brought them in, we started training them, teaching them, teaching them different skills. For example, we taught them how to make baskets. And now this basket, fireless basket, was important for us because it provided the parents with an opportunity to be able to cook and save their food. It was like something that keeps the food warm. And they developed skills on how to make, like here you can see the making, and every parent had their own basket so that they could cook the food, cover it, go and work and come and find the food is still hot. So that enabled the parents to be encouraged to come. We taught them on money matters. Some of them, quite a number of them had never been to a bank. So they had a, a, a center where they were now collecting. Every Saturday they come, they collect money together and they go and bank. And what we did is we ensured that every parent had the chance to go and bank the money so that they learn how banking goes on. And then the other one was making beadwork. So again, we trained them on how to make beads and the beads that they made, they sold. And because they were parents of children with disabilities, the selling became easy because people were volunteering to buy at a higher cost because they knew it was benefiting uh, the children with disabilities. We also taught them how to make soap. And this was a multi-purpose soap where the soap could be used to clean the, the clothes of their children, to use to clean their houses, and to use even for bathing. Uh, you know for sure that children with the disabilities soil their clothes very frequently. And therefore, soap is a very expensive commodity in homes. And then, of course, we provided counseling for the parents so that uh, they get out of the stigma, they get out of uh, fears, and this was on every Saturday after the activities, they would be involved in uh, counseling to improve their self-esteem. Next. So this is what has been happening from 2009, and the program still running, uh, Inclusion Club episode 58, they have discussed this program in length, at least for physical activity. You will see this uh, experience and how we have ensured that all uh, children with disabilities around the university are catered for and then we can sustain it through volunteer uh, students. Unfortunately, with COVID, uh, this was disrupted recently because the university closed, the volunteers are not there, but we are hoping to regroup when things become better and continue from where we stopped. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. And it's great to see you again. I have not, Peter and I are friends for many, many years and I had a chance to visit him uh, at his home a number of years ago. And I haven't seen him for quite some time. So it's great to see you, it's great to reconnect. Our final speaker, and as, uh, just as a reminder to our attendees, if you do wish to get a copy of our slides and a copy of the, of the video of this presentation, please send me your email address 
And by all means, feel free to introduce yourself to your colleagues in the chat function. Um, we won't have a ton of time for a conversation at the end. So if you do have specific questions or queries to any of our speakers, please, by all means, just throw them into the chat function as well. And we'll try to address them as soon as we can. Our final speaker is Dr. Mohamed Talfat, who's the director of clinical of the clinical services department at the Shafala Center, which is in Doha, Qatar. So we're going to leave Kenya, we're going to travel north into the Middle East, and our final speaker will be joining us this morning or this afternoon or this evening uh, from Doha, Qatar. Dr. Tolfet, over to you. Do you unmute, please? Um, Dr. Tolfet, you're on mute. Uh, are you able to unmute yourself, please? Sorry, is it okay now? It is perfect now. Thank all right, you. all right. Thanks for the invitation, David, and thanks for the, all the nice presentations that we heard. And uh, now I would like to um, share our experience with you uh, in Qatar with Shafala Center uh, for the uh, persons with the disability. Uh, actually, uh, our main target are the uh, mental disability or with the different complex conditions and autism spectrum uh, disorders in Qatar. And uh, actually this building started uh, in 1999, Shafa, uh, the Shafala has started with 20. Now we are uh, hosting up to uh, 600 uh, candidates uh, from all the different disabilities with, with uh, comprehensive uh, uh, research, uh, with comprehensive services uh, all, all together on the same building, yeah. Next slide. Uh, there is a whole unit for the uh, adapted physical education, which is one of the main parts of the educational service, uh, getting usually daily, uh, 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 taking uh, in account the rights of the people with disability, uh, and no one would be left behind. Um, uh, and uh, we have all these units covering the uh, students from three to 20 years old. Uh, and 21 years old, they graduate usually. Uh, we have the job training unit as well. So from 16 to 21, those who are eligible for the job training, we have different disabilities uh, in different units. Um, uh, of course, they will get internal classes and external classes as well, two sessions per week, each session 40 minutes, which is done inside the center and the external training where a group of students is selected according to their abilities and the criteria required for each sport. Uh, uh, for example, in winter games or summer games, yeah. Next, please. Yeah, the process, of course, uh, there will be a medical fitness. We have a clinic here and uh, uh, we started with the clinical fitness. After that, they do the basic motor skill assessment, uh, which is conducted at the beginning of the academic year. And each individual plan will be done for each student. And uh, based on these assessments and the results, uh, 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 there will be, uh, and, and the individual uh, assessment, education, coaching, coaching plan for each student individually. And this will ensure the quality, of course, according to the evidence-based uh, models. Uh, yeah, next. Uh, yeah, regarding the events, although now we, we are restricted by the, uh, COVID-19 circumstances, but we are going to come to that uh, in the next slides. But we have the annual sports festival, we have the cross-country racing, we have the annual autism championship uh, and the annual uh, bowling championship. We also uh, have the annual uh, speed skating festival and the annual Down syndrome festival. And there are also other some here and there activities when it pumps here and there, but these are one of the main yeah, next, please. Yeah, regard, yeah, according to the pandemic, of course, we have certain measurements uh, uh, and according to the government policy, they take one-to-one, -one, they come in groups and uh, uh, we have uh, also uh, uh, sport videos, a series of adaptive sport videos uh, where the filming is used there using simple alternative tools available and, and we will show you. Uh, uh, they can do it at home with simple uh, uh, instruments. We have electronic library uh, that has been created to save uh, these videos by creating sport channels 
and and uh, the MT program and giving all the parents the rights to benefit from that. We have also the uh, family help through coordination with the family service, uh, direct virtual training sessions. Uh, they got that, uh, of course, uh, in uh, enhanced with the other services uh, with a multidisciplinary team approach. Once they take, for example, speech therapy, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, of course, they, they do take a session uh, and and uh, we could, we interact with these sessions with the families and with the, with the children as much as we can. Uh, uh, we have virtual competition uh, for autism students, uh, and this was organized in the center of the bowling and the football. Yeah, next please. Yeah, these are the simple tools and equipments where, that are used at homes and virtual sports. Baskets of different sizes, uh, sponge toys of different sizes, tables, different sizes, ropes, empty cartoon boxes, empty plastic bags, different clothes, empty plastic bottles of different sizes, cartoon boxes, anything that's available there and handy and doing any type of sport while the pandemic. Next, please. Yeah, of course, regarding the Paralympics, and the para athletes so through the APA unit, uh, the Shafala has a strong relationship with the Special Olympics Qatar uh, through uh, cooperation with many local, regional, uh, then the MENA region, Middle East region, and international games. Uh, these are the examples of the regional MENA games in Tunisia, UAE, Syria, Egypt, different uh, uh, Mediterranean, and international world games, uh, the summer games, for example, and the winter games. Uh, these uh, one example is the one has been held in Russia last month, Special Olympic International World Winter Games, February two, 2022. Uh, we hope and we have an ambition actually, not only to this participation, also uh, to create some special teams like a, a special Paralympic team, for example, a special swimming team. Uh, we have a hydrotherapy and a swimming service in our uh, center. We have a hypotherapy uh, also. Uh, with cooperation with the equestrian club and we would like to create actually a para olympic uh, um, um, equestrian club equestrian team and uh, um, a special yeah a swimming team. dr yeah. told thank you very much for your thanks a lot and we are welcome to any question thank you so today we've, uh, we've, we've gone around the globe. We began with our conversation coming from Catherine in Ireland, where we looked at the um, implication of inclusive physical education through the perspective and the lens of the SDGs. We then uh, traveled to um, Finland, where Quark spoke to us about a European um, model that's looking at inclusive physical education. We then had examples from Latvia, uh, Lithuania, and Spain from our colleagues there. We then flew across the Atlantic to the United States to talk about inclusive physical education from that perspective. Then Peter joined us um, from Kenya where he made reference to uh, the Camp Shriver uh, that he initiated. And then we finished in Doha, Qatar uh, with Dr. Tolfet looking at an exemplar and an exemplar of the Shifala Center um, providing uh, outstanding and significant opportunities specifically for individuals with autism on the autism spectrum and intellectual disability in that context. We do have, again, about seven minutes for questions, so not a ton of time. Um, as a reminder, if you are wanting a copy of our slide deck and the video, please include your email address to me directly or to everyone, again, if you want to introduce yourself in the chat function. But I do have, I have, do have one question that I'd like to finish with. Catherine began the process talking about um, the importance of quality education and reduced inequalities from an SDG perspective. And, um, and then Peter actually made reference to the 1 billion individuals with disabilities, uh, and many of whom are in developing nations. Many of the presentations that we spoke about today came from uh, Northern nations. So examples being Latvia, Spain, Finland, um, United States. And then Megan made mention to, you know, coming out of the pandemic, the hope that, you know, we would learn from, you know, the experience, both the, the things that we did really well previously, and then perhaps things that we can add that are new. 
I'm wondering if our speakers can very quickly just make reference to if, if we didn't want to just rely on hope and we wanted to, you know, perhaps be a bit more uh, systematic and purposeful in returning from the pandemic. And I realize that all of our nations that are listening in today are at various stages of uh, vaccinations and, and coming out of the pandemic. If, if we had some suggestions as to how we could perhaps, again, not relying on hope, come out of the pandemic in a bit more purposeful way to ensure that we are in, in increasing quality education and reducing inequalities through inclusive physical education. If there were any suggestions, I would love to hear some comments uh, from you. And so Catherine, I'll start with you. I saw that your hand was up. Thanks, David. I, I think, you know, it's an opportunity to hold governments to account hold state parties to account and also organizations that have a responsibility to deliver on these inclusive actions. So, you know, I think to date we've been very light in terms of calling, say, universities, for example, to ensure that programs in sport and physical education and physical activity cover inclusion effectively and intersectional inclusion, including disability and other marginalized populations, they have a responsibility to deliver on that. But often in a university context, it's considered a niche optional area that people can maybe deliver on or maybe they won't. And it's really something that we, we need to kind of, again, socialize within the university sector, that this is something that will enable a workforce to emerge that has the capacity to deliver on inclusion like we wanted to do. From a governmental level, the SDGs all around the world, governments are you know, submitting their reports on how they're meeting the sustainable development goals and how through that process, they are leaving no one behind. I think I would really give a strong call to governments to look at what they are doing in terms of inclusion and inclusive physical education, physical activity and sport covering different areas of government often. There's a strong opportunity to really advocate for that. And uh, it aligns with governmental responsibilities that they have signed up to and they also need to report on. So to capture on the data piece that many people mentioned, if the data is not there, there, it's very hard to report on it. So it is a call as well for governments to get their acts together and report on these things, get the data uh, in an internationally comparable way. The indicators are there now. They're there from the processes uh, involved in Kazan Action Plan implementation. They're also there from the human rights processes. So I would really encourage, hold people to account for what they have signed up to deliver on in terms of human rights obligations and also in terms of SDG obligations. And they are relevant across the world. Thank you, Catherine. Well said, and I think I believe Peter mentioned that too when he talked about all the nations that had signed on to the to the convention, but were yet not fulfilling their responsibilities. Kwok, I saw that you had your hand up as well. Yeah, um, I, I would concur completely with what Catherine has said um, in terms of the urge and the need and the accountability. But I'd also like to raise the attention that uh, in the education setting, physical education is not top priority. But yet there were so many benefits out from there, from a financial, from a social, from a, from a physical health perspective, that this type of uh, awareness needs to be made across the education sector in disability uh, statistics as well. We see a lot of the disability uh, statistics uh, surveys, for example, they lack the instrument to talk about physical education or even physical activity, generally speaking. So we miss out on this type of information. And this is something that we should also work with, that people who are who do work accountability wise with the disability information in education, but also to put a focus on physical education as well as physical activity. And when we can do that, then we're working better and stronger together. Thank you, Kwok. We do have just a few minutes left. Do any of our other speakers wish to speak to that question, that comment? Peter, yeah, I'll let I you have- I'd like to- I'd like to share one or two points. One is that there's need to understand that we can make a change by focusing on one life at a time. You know, not focusing on changing everybody, but people around you and building, you know, strength from your environment. Sometimes we focus on things that are too far away. Uh, and forget the people around you. Those are the people who can buy in and help you 
to move on. Uh, we need to use the networks that we have developed uh, for those of us who are here to use those networks to strengthen activities, for example, around the world. I can give an example, for example, we did not know how to play Bosha. And because of that, I invited uh, Reina to come to Kenya to teach us on how to play Bosha. And uh, I trained my students and my students know, now they go into the community and they train young people in the community. So using the networks that we have can also help us to learn how to increase uh, sport opportunities for young people with disabilities. Thirdly, I want to say that people are always happy to see successful things. We cannot have people joining us in the disability when they see only poor, and poor programs, programs that are based on sympathy, but we should be able to come up with programs that will show success. Success that even television can cover. And when people see successful things, they are more likely to join and help. That's how we have successfully had our program from 2009 to now, because of the interest they see in the changing nature of young people with disabilities, learning how to swim, learning how to play basketball, joining the national uh, Uh, Special Olympics until they come from this club, then the nation, the ministry support us on this thing. So I want to say success, improvement in how people view people with disabilities. Thank you, Peter. Now, Catherine, I saw your hand was up. If it's really quick, and Raul, I see your hand is up too, but we're already over time now. And so I just wanted to make sure that we allowed people to, to leave in a timely fashion. Uh, Catherine, is there, is there something perhaps you can throw in the chat function or Raul, is there something to throw in the chat? Yeah, can I say something, David? Of course. Uh, yes, uh, I think I agree with, uh, with Casey. It's, 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 it's really important that uh, we open, especially in physical education or in the regular school, open the, the what we think about the, the diversity. Usually when we talk about adaptive physical activity or adaptive para sport, we link uh, with the regular structure of para sport, like a visual, physical, intellectual impairment. So diversity is open to other, other, other groups. So uh, our experience uh, training uh, in service physical educators, they really feel and prepare with other uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, for example. So uh, usually we link our training programs uh, is close related to, with a sport or para link is a sport or para sport. So we need to open the, the spectrum of diversity in order to, to reduce the inequalities and have a real inclusion or real equity in, in, in education. So this is something that I would like to point. Thanks, Raul. Catherine, you get final final word and then we'll, we'll close. Uh, David, I just put a link in the chat there to the We the 15 campaign that's launching tomorrow at the IPC CRPD event. It involves uh, IPC, Special Olympics, Virtus, uh, Def Olympics, and a number of others to raise attention on disability inclusion in and through sport. So for those of you interested, it's a decade long campaign that launches tomorrow. There's the link in the chat box. So um, anybody interested in this topic will be interested in that. Wonderful. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Megan, for your comment about Dr. Lieberman as well. Um, everyone, thank you so much for joining. I know this is only the start of the conference for you uh, based at the United Nations this week, so I very much appreciate your willingness. On behalf of IFAPA, you know, we're social media mavens. We like to hashtag like anybody else, and so we're going to take a picture of those who are in attendance. So if you're willing to, if you want to put on your camera, we're going to take a screenshot of all those that are in attendance right now. You can smile your smiliest best uh, and then you'll be trending by the end of the day. You can tell all your friends that you can, you know, hashtag your trend. So Quack, are you ready to take the photograph? All right, so at three, and when I say one, we'll all smile. So three, two, one. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna have there. to do this a few times because we've got quite a few, uh, quite a few faces. So just, right. uh, just the first one. Keep smiling. Keep your nice smile there, everyone. 
And if you're not smiling, I've got a nice trick for you to keep smiling. Um, but maybe I can show that to you just after a little bit after I've taken these quick screenshots. Um, and then, yeah, so that's the first set. Do we want to do a second one? Do you want to see the trick? No, maybe that comes in another time. Keep smiling. I think that have, may have to wait for another time. We've already gone over time. Right, right. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure to meet you. I really appreciated all your comments and questions in the chat function and very much appreciated. I'm grateful for your attendance today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and we will follow up with the PDF of the PowerPoints and also the video of this presentation. Have a great rest of your Monday. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.